Hi, everyone. It's Sean from Pulse Markets here. Uh, I've got the chairman of the Tungsten Metal Group, Tony Adcock, with me today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about tungsten and the critical metal that it is, where it's produced, uh, what region it comes from and why it's so important. We're then going to talk about why uh, the Tungsten Metal Group will play a pivotal role in the production of ferrotungsten in the future. Uh, we'll find out why it's so important with their location in Southeast Asia. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce the chairman, Tony Adcock, and welcome you here today. So thanks, Tony. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for your time. As I said, initially, we're going to talk about tungsten and how important it is in the global supply chains. But firstly, Tony, can you just give us an understanding of the commodity tungsten and why it's so critical to industry? Yeah, look, um, tungsten is really a critical mineral, but by definition, it's in short supply. It's only produced in certain certain number of countries around the world, and and um, to our benefit, most of the production, about ninety six percent of the world's production, comes from China and Russia. So to some extent, we're very we're in a very fortunate place in the critical minerals market, because you know we we basically can access and produce you know the remaining four percent of the world's market. That's fantastic. So that four percent. Uh being produced outside of China and Russia. We, we all know there's a lot of sanctions on Russia at the moment because of what's happening in Ukraine um, and China. There have been supply issues getting it outside of China. So I know that Europe and America are looking at getting that supply from external sources. Uh, but why is tungsten more critical than just another metal? I think what, what tungsten does is it's, it's become very valuable to the defence industry, uh, to the transport industry, to the energy industries, um, you know, it's essentially a value add to strengthen steel wherever steel is used. More and more, as the oil and gas and mining industries open up, where they have some, you know, fairly deep shafts and so on, we can we can produce value added products that enhance anything to do with steel. Probably, um, you know, even your phone, even a Tesla car has some sort of tungsten in it. Okay, you just touched on something important there. The uh, the USA has introduced legislation which will shake up the critical metals market, uh, including rare earths like your Hastings, which makes magnets. We've got tungsten um, included in that. Uh, can you just talk about this act that the US has introduced? Yeah, well, it's not just it's not just the act, uh, Sean. The um, Australia, and New, uh, Australia and the US have signed a critical minerals agreement a, a couple of months ago. And so both the US and Europe have... Um, have tungsten as a critical mineral, um, which which really almost is like having a you know a rare animal around the world. You know, it's it's protected, and because we de-risk the supply chain from China and Russia, um, you know, we, we become increasingly important. Now we um, we operate in Vinbao, which is Vietnam, so outside of China, outside of Russia. Um, traditionally, our markets have been. Uh, into Asia, we've unsold into into Asia, specifically Japan. Um, our plant has been going since 2013, and um, by by de-risking, you know, the supply chain from China Russia, not only will we grow the market into Japan, but we'll we'll move also into the U.S. market. And to touch on your question, the Act enables us to do that, and um, my, our plan is to develop the U.S. market and, and potentially the European markets in a strong way. Uh, well. So virtually that supply risk to the West, they're looking for external countries apart from Russia and China to secure tungsten from. And I mean, where else can they actually <coughs> furnace tungsten? Like that's the furnace you're sitting in front of just there or a picture that's of right. where, where else can the US and the West and Europe get tungsten from uh, apart from Russia and China? Yeah. So like us, we would source our tungsten from um, from Africa, from Mongolia, uh, Kazakhstan, to some extent in the future, um, South Korea, Spain and Portugal. Um, we have a deliberate, and I think the US backs this up, we have a deliberate policy of ethical sources. So we won't, for example, buy from Myanmar. Um, in my view, that gives us a really great market because I see in the next decade at least, Russia is going to use its own supply to keep its country going. China will probably do the same, although they may export to Russia, but there'll be a there'll be a little cartel on their own, and we can we can source ours from the countries I just mentioned, um, which is essentially conflict conflict zone free. 
Okay, well, I, I know there's one mine that will be huge coming out in Sang Dong in South Korea, which you can yeah. certainly source tungsten of from. So we're, we had a client's invest in our Monty Industries uh, last year, so we're very well aware that there will be enough product for you to um, furnace. Yeah. But uh, what we might do now is just have a little bit more of a chat about uh, the Tungsten Metal Group, or TMG, as we like to call it. And uh, you'll be the largest producer outside of China. And uh, if you could just tell us about TMG now, that, that would be great. Yeah, so, Sean, I mean, we, we are the largest uh, tungsten furnace outside of China and Russia, as, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we're a processor, so we're not tied to a particular mine. We're not tied to any particular source. We go the other way. We go downstream, and we're the processor of that, um, of that metal. Um, we're the largest, most efficient plant outside of China and, and Russia. And we have a you know, production capacity of about 16 tonnes a day. Um, that translates into about 4,000 tonnes per annum. You know, that's, that's where we are. We're, we're in a place called Vinbao, which is a, a small community um, about an hour from Haiphong and Hanoi. And we employ uh, local labour in the, in the factory that we've got or the plant that we've got. So, Tony, you've mentioned the plants in Vietnam. Is there any sovereign risk when being in Vietnam? Sure, and I think there's always sovereign risk when you're working in a, another jurisdiction. But I think the, the strength of relationship between Vietnam and Australia is incredibly strong. The federal and state governments are putting a lot of effort into developing that. They've just appointed the new ambassador to Hanoi, uh, whom we've got to know, and we may meet when we're up there. Um, we're working strongly with Austrade in terms of their missions to Vietnam and also to help us get into the States and, and elsewhere. Um, you know, I think we, we've got to protect ourselves from sovereign risk. We've got agreements on remittance of funds back from Vietnam to Australia as we need it because we will be an ASX listed company. Um, I, I think the sovereign risk is minimal at this moment in time and perhaps for the foreseeable future, uh, simply because the relationships are there. The second point I'd make probably is Vietnam and China don't have a great relationship currently and therefore Vietnam are positioning them, themselves as you know a safe haven for Australian money. Okay that's great. Uh, with with this plant in Vietnam it's fully established you can actually see in the photo there's uh the furrow tungsten's coming out of the furnace. Uh, right. You've said that you're the largest uh economic producer outside of China and Russia. Uh why haven't hasn't someone else done this? Like are there barriers to entry? Like what's the problem? I think there's there's barriers to physical entry in the sense that this plant was a, a copy of a plant, that, the most efficient plant in, in China. And the, the guy we have running it, the president of the company in, in Vietnam, worked for that company, brought the designs into Vietnam in 2013, built the plant, and I have developed it ever since. Um, it would probably take 30 million and two years to build a plant of that nature. And you'd probably have to steal the expertise to do so because it's um, it's it's very specialist. On top of that, you've really got to understand the tungsten industry. It's a, it's a not only a critical metal; it's a very hot metal. You know th what you see in the background is maybe three thousand degrees centigrade. So you really need to understand how to produce top quality tungsten. You know, and it's, it's almost alchemy. Okay, and. Speaking about having that management, having that team, I know you've got an experienced board to face with the ASX we'd like to hear about, but you've also got a team that can run that plant and you've got a general manager uh, who's also a director who knows the tungsten market and who knows how to refine tungsten. So you, you've sort of, it's a management team built in, the tungsten plant working. Uh, we'll go into the recent run that you've done so we know it all works, but can you just go over who management is at the moment and yeah. uh, give us an example of, who the team's made up of. Certainly. So th the overall staff of the plant is ranges between 30 and 80 people. So 80 at the top of production where we're doing several runs a day. The company doesn't just have a production plant itself, but we have laboratories to test the, the equipment and so on. We have an equipment lab and so on. And we employ probably mainly women from the local community who've worked there, I'd say on and off from, from 2013. We don't, we don't have a high turnover. We bring in a specialist team of about 10 to 15 people when we're doing a production run. And this team is led by George Chen, who is a 
global tungsten metals expert. And George is hands-on. He, he stays with the production. He's up in the middle of the night when they're doing an overnight run, and he keeps an eye on it. He's very proud of his skill um, in, in, in the tungsten market. So I'd say we're very lucky to have a global tungsten market expert on site. Outside of that, um, you know, we have the usual accounting teams and so on. Outside of Vietnam, we, we, we run fairly lean. We have a CEO, Martin McQuaid, who's based in Perth. We have a company secretary and a CFO also based in Perth, um, and myself on the board are here. Dr. Karen Lloyd, who's a metallurgist on the board, uh, she's also a geo. Uh, she understands this industry very well. She's been in this, in this industry for a long time. So she's our metallurgist and, and linked to understanding quality and process for this industry. We have Martin McQuaid, who's the CEO, who's one of the original um, participants in this. He used to be COO of this particular company some years ago. And we have Dr. Uh, sorry, Jerry Kazmarek, who's our CFO with a very deep mining background. So, you know, he provides the smarts in terms of the understanding of how to account for production from, you know, such a factory. Because, you know, when you're doing this, you get you get scrap, you get byproducts, you get all sorts of other things. So they all have to be accounted for. Um, and then I'm fortunate to chair the company. I'm honored to chair the company. My background is, is capital markets uh, and um, governance and risk and strategy across a whole num number of industries. Um, you know, so you've got, I think, quite a diverse and yet expert board. You mentioned George Chen too. One of the things we did to de-risk the, the, the link with um, Vietnam was to make sure that George was on our board and therefore he's wholly accountable to the rest of the directors and our shareholders at the board level. Okay, Tony, great. Just that background, can you just reiterate uh, the difference of where TMG is at now and where it was previously? Yeah, thanks, Sean. Yeah, look, um, TMG, or as it was known at that time as ATC, it was part of another group that really had a focus on other areas, nickel, for example. And whereas the, the tungsten asset itself was a really good, profitable core asset that, run, that ran really well in production. So it was really imperative that at some point um, the asset you know, came into another vehicle. So a couple of years ago, I was invited in by a couple of investors. I was, I was asked to uh, reconstitute the board, um, clean up the company a little bit. And that's where our focus has been for the last two years, Sean. I can confidently say we've been working with Team G for at least 12 months, uh, almost a year and a half now, and we've seen the change in the company and we've seen it getting ready for the ASX listing, getting ready uh, to start making money again. And the margins that you can make uh, from this plant are significant. Uh, can you go through how the company actually makes money? Because we're not mining. We don't have any exploration risk. Uh, yeah. This is simply buying tungsten or raw tungsten then putting it in the kiln and producing ferrotoxin, and there's a margin to be made. Uh, can we talk about that margin and how it worked in the recent run you've just done? So we know the plant works. We know it's in good shape. Let's just talk to the margins, please. Yeah, so typically um, we buy our concentrate from the countries I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, we bring that concentrate into Haiphong and then Vinbao. Um, clearly we buy that um, in bulk uh, specifically for each run. Uh, although in the future we might we might stockpile some depending on the market, um, we then produce the tungsten over a period of two or three weeks, maybe four weeks, um, to to order to offtake. Our margins are typically twenty to twenty five percent, but on our recent run, which was only a few months ago, um, we produced about uh, three hundred and sixty three tons of ferrotungsten or tungsten as you call it. And that margin, when I was looking at it yesterday, um, was about 26%. Now, I believe we can get 26%, 25 26% absolutely consistently. Um, we can make the processing plant more efficient over time. It's got to meet Australian standards, as, as you all know. Um, so we need to make sure that the quality is always going to be really high. So really, it's just the margin in the market over um, our efficiency in producing it. The con we buy, where we source it from, the timing of that source, depending on the market. George Chen, our president director in Vietnam, is very knowledgeable about timing for buying concentrate. And he's very, very specific. You know, he's absolutely hands-on during the production runs uh, to make sure that we extract 
every ounce of value from every run. So it, it, the, the, the big issues I see with the company are not drilling, hoping for something. Uh, you've got to be able to buy and you've got to be able to sell. Is, is it easy to buy the concentrate? It is. It is easy to buy the concentrate. We've got um, proven sources around the world. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the Spain, the Portugal's, the Africa's, Mongolia's, Kazakhstan's, um, South Korea with Almonte when that comes on, you know, will be a really great benefit to this market and a safer a safer source as well. And so I, I don't. We don't have any problem in buying. Um, in terms of selling, we, we sell essentially to order. So we would have the offtake agreements in place. And anything we don't sell specifically to a, an offtake agreement, we can sell on the open market. So we're very confident of that. You know, there's an 8% compound growth per annum predicted for the for the tungsten market. And that, you know, will bring, give us about 115,000 metric tons, uh, probably by 2026. Now, with that market and our share of it, de-risking the supply chain, I think we're well positioned, Sean. What percentage do you think you could be of the overall market? I, I think we've got several years advantage, um, plus we've got the quality of the tungsten that we produce to really make a go of it. And in, in the first year, George and, and uh, Martin will be really focused on getting sales into Japan, and Martin and I will be working very strongly on getting into the USA um, with the support of the Critical Minerals Agreement and people like Austrade and the federal government. So um, I think we can get a very large share of that market. In percentage terms, I mean, you're not going to overwhelm it, are you? Or... No, that's a really good point. Look, I think if the annual market say 12,000 tonnes, and within three years we can produce 4,000 tonnes, there's your answer. And probably with that 12,000 tonnes, you know, 90% of it's outside of is inside Russia and China. So I, I think we're very well positioned. Um, and with, with these problems that we're having with Russia now, and yeah. uh, when I was dealing with our Monty, a lot of European countries want to secure supply outside of China uh, for supply chain issues. Uh, I think it's very prudent to know that you've got Europe, America, there's a very big market for you to supply into, and you're the only... Uh, company out there outside of Russian China that can actually deliver that at the moment. Yeah, look, I think that's our competitive advantage right now. So we've got the competitive advantage. How sustainable is it? I think we've got two years before competitors can come in and that will take them two years before they build another up another plant. So say four. Um, and then I think if we've built our reputation correctly, uh, we'll be in a we'll be in a very strong position. So we just did a we just did a production run uh, back in June, which is yeah. in the stock market. It's could be years away, but in reality, in producing terms, it's it's almost just just two months ago. So what was the size? And I think you mentioned three hundred and six tons. And what's the value of that? If we could just try and get that value, we could see a twenty six percent margin on that. Yeah, look, we we produced three hundred and sixty three tons. Um, it was a toll run for a, another a third party, but what it proved proved to us was that the production plant's working very effectively and very efficiently. That's probably worth I don't know ten mil, something like that. You know, by the time. So that that's the... a two and a half or two point six million dollar margin. That yeah. the, the the profit on that run, forgetting well, corporate. Actually, market. thinking about it, is probably closer to two, yeah. and. Um, of course, we don't see that because we don't really know in this particular toll run, we don't really know what they bought it at. So we can only estimate. But if we're working out the margins, that's where we're sort of sitting historically. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's two million. And how long did that take? That, that takes, each production run takes about four to six weeks and end-to-end. And, to end. and the reason for that is we spend one to two weeks making sure the plant's running really well. So we've got the, the guys in there making sure it's ready to go. You've got four weeks of maybe two, three shifts a day. Yeah. Um, and then, um, you know, by the time you finish, you've probably got your 300 to 360 tonnes uh, output. Uh, we're, we're aiming for 4,000 tonnes after two and a half years. Um, my first year, I reckon, after IPO, minimum 1,200 tonnes. If I can get the guys to get to 1,800 tonnes, um, you know, that's profit. That's sure, pure profit. So what, what I'm trying to get at here, and I'm liking the yeah. way you're talking, is that if we're doing 4,000 tonnes, so that, 
let's just say 10 times the current run uh, per annum if we work on the proper 2 million. Is that USD or AUD? That's USD. And we're, okay, we're so we'll thing. focus on USD for the moment because obviously the Aussie is much lower, but it does go up and down. <laughs> uh, so if we're looking at, could we do 10 of those runs? In a, or you can't do 10. Yeah, we can't do 10, but we can certainly do six. And I'd say in the first year, if we were doing four or five, I think that would be a good thing. You know, we're basically saying that we'd have an EBITDA at 4,000 tonnes after, say, two and a half years, we'd have an EBITDA about, of about 21 million Aussie. And that 21 million Aussie. And so yeah. we're looking at, uh, now let's get into the deal. There. So we, and we're not prospecting. That's just furnishing the tungsten Absolutely. in that plant that's behind you. We, we know yeah. it works. We've tested it. So we're yeah. bringing this back to the ASX. We've got a new management team. We've got a new entity. We've got costs being controlled. It's it's a whole new company. Uh, investors can be rest assured. We've already tested it, so we know it's there. Um, we're looking at about 21 million EBIT. What, what's the value of the company we're looking at at the moment? Yeah, so the, the company's probably 20, 20 million with economic value of maybe enterprise value, probably about 19. The furnace itself, in US dollar terms, the furnace itself is probably worth three million because because temperatures are so hot for runs, we have to have the liner of the of the furnace in tungsten. So you've probably got a three million US dollar asset sitting there. So what are we calling four and a half million Aussie assets sitting there? Um, you know, as the liner, I'd say the EV is probably nineteen. Okay, so with the plan to IPO um, early next year, we've got three raises to get there. We've got a convertible note, which we're doing at the moment, uh, which is six fifty. We've then got the pre-IPO in November, um, and then the IPO next year. The convertible note will be used for the valuation and getting the company one hundred percent ready uh, to launch to ASX. I know you've already been in discussion with the ASX. We've done everything we've needed to to get the company relisted so that's on track the pre-ipo will give us the funds to get through to the ipo and pay all those costs and then the ipo what will you do with the six and a half million there most of that money will go to doing the first production run so that's just you know, buying but, tungsten just buying tungsten so, so to, it's to not a drill tungsten. kit it, it's not uh exploration it's actually buying tungsten absolutely to it's process. Pro you know it, yeah, Sean, you, you've hit it on the nail correctly. You know, we're, we're not a, we're not in development. We're not in discovery. We're a running processing plant. straight to revenue, straight through revenue. So you know, we buy the concentrate, we put it through the we put it through the production plant, we sell it, um, and and receive the funds for that within you know a month of um, a month of production, and um, and that's the revenue into the company. Once we've done one production run, we're self sufficient. Now, one of the things we're going to do is, you know, with the, you, you mentioned the money, four and a half out of that will go into a concentrate purchase. Um, we'll do a run. We'll sell that. Going forward, when we have a bit more of a track record, we will probably do trade finance for half of our con purchases every time. So we're smoothing our cash flows. Um, we're building up credibility with the, the financiers and the, you know, the trade financiers and so on. Um, but this first time around, Four and a half out of that six, six and a half um, will be will be used for that. Okay. Um, uh, and with that IPO valuation, we're looking at the plant being, I think the pre-IPO value is around 21 million after the con note and the pre-IPO. And yep. then we'll put six million on top of that or six and a half million. So we're looking at a, an EV of about 27 million at that particular point in time. And just to qualify, just one more time for our listeners, if you're going to be generating around 21 EBIT in, say, two and a half years, if we do that times a multiple of eight, uh, that's where our valuation can sort of head, can't it? Yeah, look, I, I agree. I think that's I think that's correct. You know, I think, um, you know, when I say two and a half, two and a half years time, that's our projections from IPO to get to that a bit there of, of 21. I mean, it, it's hard to look at a comparable. Do you know any comparables on the ASX that we could compare this to? I mean, I've just picked eight times uh, yeah. out of my head. I haven't got a comparable to it. But have you guys looked at where this could actually potentially go? I, I think, you know, it's really hard. I mean, when you look at other critical minerals, you've got, you know, you can probably look at some of the, the, the early stage lithium companies. 
Um, but, you know, lithium will be surpassed by other things for batteries and so on. Whereas I don't think tungsten, which is a, you know, a strengthener of steel, will be surpassed. So it's not as popular as lithium right now, but it is a critical mineral used for steel. What we're looking at is what are the value added things that companies could do with our product? And we will target those companies and talk to them about the value add. And things like 3D printing, things like collars for, um, for drill bits, subsea and on land uh, drip mining, um, things like uh, you know the car industry, the defense industry, and so on. Anything to do with toughening steel will be there. Other critical minerals can't really do it in the same way, Sean. Okay, well, that's fascinating. I mean, the, the multiple just using my calculator at eight times works yeah. out about six times your initial investment without any exploration risk with the plant that's already been confirmed. So I, th I think that's a really good point too. There's no exploration risk. You know, rightly or wrongly, I've taken a view that we, we shouldn't go down, we shouldn't go upstream, I should say, and buy a mine. What we should do is make sure we've got very secure supplier contracts um, into our processing plant. And that way we can go the other way, which is produce top quality um, tungsten and sell that into the downstream industries that will use it well. Um, I, I think we've covered a lot today. So we're headed towards IPO in the first quarter of next year. Uh, everything's looking great with the company. Uh, that picture is a real picture of the mine work or the plant yeah. working, not the mine, the plant. Uh, That's right. So I think it's very exciting. I, I think the risk of the kill not working when we've just proven that it works is 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 low. Uh, but I do see this as a, a nice yield play uh, when interest rates are going up. I mean, even if we invest in this today, I know you need to reinvest the money over the next two and a half years. But at that point, you could even look at paying dividends. I think that's right, Sean. It, it's certainly our intent to pay dividends over time. I think we need to make sure that we've done a couple of years of really healthy reinvestment in the plant, making sure that we are where we wish to be, which is, you know, the best in the world, if you like, or one of the best in the world outside China and Russia. Then I think it'll be a natural decision to return money to our shareholders through dividends, um, in addition to the capital gains that they would get, you know, along the way. Tony, listen, I really thank you for your time. Uh, it's been thank enlightening. You, this is a very interesting um, story. Uh, we can see the upside there. And it's just execution risk. And I think you've got the right team to make it work this time. Uh, I know you're very experienced on the board of quite a few ASX listed companies. Your corporate governance is very good. So I think this time has got a very good chance of working uh, because you've got the right team. Uh, I, I totally agree. We've got the right board, right management team. And we're really in the right position, you know, at the right time, Sean. Yeah, I, I think this supply chain of 90% in Russia and China, only 10% outside of it, it's uh, you've got the world at your feet. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for the interview. Look forward to catching up soon. We'll be in touch. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Sean.